looking beyond the infrastructure's expectations, looking beyond the end user's demands, looking beyond our limited financial resources, looking beyond enhancing the asset's performance, and looking beyond traditional asset management approaches, all of which are dreams in the sky without any proper implementation plans in the ground to achieve. Have you ever asked yourselves, how can enhancing the infrastructure affect your lives? Infrastructure is the roads you're driving on, the water you're drinking, sewer systems you're using, the electricity, whether the, the lights or the, um, or the air conditions and cooling systems, you're turning on and off on a daily basis. Every single thing in your daily life is based on the infrastructure. So, the infrastructure is simply the foundations of our daily lives that enables our communities to prosper and our local businesses to grow. The relationship between the infrastructure development and the country's economic growth is simply like a permanently married couple who can never get divorced. Think it over. Let's imagine it together. The infrastructure development, whenever it increases, the quality of life is going to increase. And by then, the country's economic growth is going to increase. So in that context, Finance Canada has showed a study that one billion investment in the infrastructure development is going to create 16,700 jobs. So can you imagine that one billion investment is going to create 16,700 jobs? And you can be one of these guys working for this infrastructure development. Not only that, but it also boosts the country's JDP by $1.6 billion, which is a great investment. It also attracts the foreign investors to come and invest in our country because of the solid and stable infrastructure system that's already in the country and opens up new companies that already you can be working in. But the miserable fact that I'm really sorry to share with you today is that the, our infrastructure is in a very dire condition state that requires a visit to a doctor. Canada has recently issued the second infrastructure report showing that one third of the municipal infrastructure is in a critical condition that requires immediate actions and that also increases the risk of service disruption. So can you imagine that about 25% of our infrastructure or our roads are operating above capacities and about 41% of the municipalities doesn't even have inspection programs for their highways so they don't know the performance even of their highways and many other disappointing facts but the question is why why is all of that happening it's because of that the improper revenue distribution the municipalities take only 8 cents on each and every tax dollar and they are responsible for like 57% of the infrastructure. So can you imagine a fantastic building with a weak foundation? What's it gonna happen? It's gonna fail whatsoever it looks like, right? Not only Canada's worth and attention, but also US is experiencing around the same extent with an overall GPA of D plus. So about 69% of the infrastructure in US is in a poor condition. And the drinking water representing one of the most crucial assets is a D approaching a failing condition with a perceptually declining level of service. And all of these information are in 2013. So guess what's happening right now in 2016? But the question that all of you are asking right now yourselves is, why should we bother ourselves with those stretched facts? What's, what happened and caused these critical factors to happen? It's all about wrong decisions. Wrong decisions that we have already taken in managing their, these kind of assets. Our grandfathers were like mistaken in managing these assets and it caused growing budget deficits, a delayed backlog of repair and construction for this kind of infrastructure that hurts each and every Canadian family and business. So for, for years and years, the government have been managing their assets in a new philosophy of design, build, and forget. Forget about the infrastructure, just pay less attention to the service life, which is considered to be one of the most important factors in the infrastructure world. For 25 years, the government has b have been watching the symptoms of the infrastructure deficit growing and growing through rusting bridges, crumbling roads, thousands of drinking water warnings, and nothing happened. But the result was a chronic municipal infrastructure funding crunch that has been estimated to be $123 billion. Can you imagine the number? Just $123 billion for repairing the existing infrastructure. And another $115 billion for just building new ones to account for the growing population. Not only that is the result of the growing infrastructure deficit, but also 
our aging infrastructure. So according to a study that has been done by Dr. Mirza in McGill, about 60% of our infrastructure are over 55 years. And even more and more, 30% are over 55, 85 years. And the final cut was that 80% of our infrastructure have already exhausted their service life. The aging infrastructure smell is beginning to spread over and over, resulting in catastrophic failures, just like what happened right here in the Le Concord overpass. So this overpass on a Saturday afternoon, 30th of September 2006, it failed, crushing a number of vehicles beneath and resulting in a number of injuries and valuable life losses. So what are we waiting for? It's not now an issue of aging infrastructure, growing budget deficits, as much as it's concerned with our safety and health, which should stay the top proper priorities of the government. Nowadays, the federal government is trying to push more and more money towards the municipalities as a new municipal funding programs to aid them to support this infrastructure. But the question is, do you think this is sufficient to solve the problems efficiently and rapidly? The answer is, Absolutely no, because the current infrastructure gap is way more what the governmental financial resources could afford to, which creates the need for the private sector or for another extra funding source to come and interact to fill this vastly growing gap. So the solution is PPP, public-private partnership, a kind of a partnership agreement between the public and the private sector just to transfer the infrastructure risks for the private sector and to deliver the services for the citizens. So in simple words, it's a trade-off for the government. Either to go that way, take the building and operation risk, and life is never risk-free, or to pass the, the risks to the private sector, and by that way, it's going to improve the le level of service of the, for the citizens, and by this, it's going to minimize their risks as well. So PPP has been applied in Canada in about 237 projects. And according to the Canadian Council of Public-Private Partnership, about 5 to 15% cost efficiency gains has resulted when using this kind of approach. But just like any approach, there are ups and downs, and there are successful stories as much as there are learning stories. So let's go travel to Ontario and see, see what happened in Toronto in Highway 407. This highway was built in 1997, 107.3 kilometer tall highway, and has been privately leased for 99 years. Can you imagine the number? 99 years lease for the private sector. What was special in this highway was the toll collection system. We were all used that the tolls are collected through toll booths. But in this specific highway, the tolls were collected through an automated system of cameras and transporters, where they have to detect your plate in order to pay uh, your fees. This created a source of a criticism for the privatization of this kind of highway. And because of the increasing tolls, of course, and because of the plate denial system that has been introduced by the public to support the private in collecting his bills, and because of the false values that already resulted in various court battles. So can you imagine, guys, paying $43,000 just for driving in a highway? I swear it's even more than what I'm paying for my PhD, guys. Yeah, so the government goodwill and poor contract administration is what led to these undesirable circumstances. Yes, the government should understand the fundamental difference between the public and the private sector. The private sector is simply a greedy, profit-oriented organization opting for more and more profit whatsoever. So the government should be smart and they should, be, they should place a kind of a key performance indicators to measure the performance of the public se the private sector. And at the same time, they should place limits for the tolls, because, because especially in this user-based income where the private is like taking the money from us directly. Let's leave this example and travel back to Quebec in Montreal in New Champlain Bridge and see what's hap what happened out there. New Champlain Bridge connects Montreal with the South Shore, so it's a new project that has been introduced to PPP and is under construction right now. So it le it's leased for 30 years operation and maintenance for this kind of bridge for the private sector. So the government now learned from the first lesson, no more 99 years. The second lesson is that the government is responsible for specifying the toll rates, not the private sector. The private sector only collects them, and the private sector receives his money directly from the government, like he's taking a monthly payment in return to, for operating and maintaining this kind of bridge. The result was what? 
33.7 net savings compared to traditional approaches. And by the way, this is considered to be one of the largest infrastructure projects nowadays in North America. So PPP can be one of successful and one of learning stories to improve the approach. Now as we are thinking of now privatizing our infrastructure, and at the same time, we are suffering from deficits, so we need to minimize our costs, right? What about integrating the assets that are sharing the same spatial location? Just like the roads, water networks, and sewer networks. Don't you think that it's like, it's, it's gonna minimize the cost, time, and public disruption? Isn't it worth it to minimize the number of maintenance actions for these kind of spatially located assets without compromising the level of service? Absolutely it is. And one of the practical solutions is the lane rental approach. Think it over, the government does own each and every lane in the country. So it rents it for the private sector to carry out his maintenance actions. And by this, it indirectly obligates the private sector to minimize his time, his intervention time. And at the, at the same time, he's gonna maintain more efficient and effective solutions for the maintenance, not to pay more and more renting. Wearing the creative hat, I thought of why don't we amalgamate the two solutions together and think of a kind of a contract that at the same time obligates the private sector to utilize this integrated approach and ma maximize the level of service of our infrastructure. So why don't we be friends? Let's be friends approach. The name tells the story. A group of private companies that are grouped and create a joint venture, a new company that has a contract with like the public government and from this perspective, they're going to be responsible for a certain road with all the underneath utilities. So let's imagine it, how, how it's going to benefit the public sector. From a governmental perspective, this is going to be better because it's going to create an extra cooperation between the municipalities, right? Because they are, they are going to have to draft the contract together and they're going to have to work it out together because they are already one party for the private sector. At the same time, is gonna cause less intensive contract administration and management. Imagine, imagine managing just one contract instead of three contracts. It's gonna be way, way easier. So from the private sector perspective, the synergy spirit of the three privately owned companies towards maximizing their profit and minimizing their cost is gonna result on a more and more creative solutions that minimizes the cost and enhance the level of service. So everyone is happy right now. The public citizens are gonna be happy receiving a better level of service. The public is happy with the minimized cost and because of the citizens are happy and the private sector is happy with his money in the pocket. Finally, I would like to highlight an, an important infrastructure statement. A penny now is worth a dollar later. Think about the infrastructure defect as a human being suffering from a brain tumor. The earlier you detected and intervene, the more probably you're gonna save a life. And the same goes with the infrastructure. Think of a water pipe with a tiny crack. In case of delayed maintenance, what's gonna happen? The crack is gonna propagate and the pipe is gonna break, right? Which is of course undesirable, specifically in a water main pipe in a critical three section. So from a pure cost perspective, this is how it goes. Paying like $1 early is gonna save six to $10 late. And this is the area that I was talking about, wrong decisions. The wrong decisions comes exactly in this area, the, now, the difference between the now and the delayed maintenance. This is where the asset managers take wrong decisions. So finally, if I will, I would like to leave you with one final thing, is that the cost of inaction in the infrastructure world could reach tens of trillions of dollars. And who's gonna pay for that? It's simply us our grandchildren and their successors, as we are already paying because of the wrong decisions taken by our grandfathers. So please, please, promise me, we don't need to repeat the same mistakes twice, and we need to think it over before the game is over. Thank you.